On last week's show, we talked about what some of the top issues are in California. And election integrity is at the top of the list. So we started looking for someone who could come um, on board and talk to us a bit about election integrity in California. It is such a huge issue. So we have, have with us Michael Feinstein. He is candidate for Secretary of State in California, the Green Party. And the Secretary of State, as you know, is someone with the election integrity near and dear to his heart, or should be. He is the former mayor of Santa Monica and was also very active in the city council in Santa Monica. He's co-founder of the Green Party in California. And his platform, I really like his platform, his main planks, Democracy Bill of Rights, Voter Choice, Clean Money, and election integrity. Welcome, Michael, to, to Progressive California. We are so glad that you are here. Thank you so much, and thank you for that beautiful introduction. Oh, you're welcome. I hope I got it all right, and, and if I didn't, I'm really sorry. Very um, kind. <laughs> before we jump into the nitty gritty, I'm hoping maybe you can take a few moments and just tell us what what's the role of the Secretary of State of California? What would your roles and, re and responsibilities be if you're elected? Yeah, so the Secretary of State is the chief elections official for all of California. She or he is responsible for running all the state elections and also for giving guidance to the counties, as well as recommending changes in state law that facilitate the election process to the state legislature. So it's really the central point for public trust in our elections in all of California. Perfect. That, that is uh, a lot of times we are talking to congressional and Senate candidates and we don't get the special secret sauce that goes into what you would do as Secretary of State. Um, we talked a little bit last week when you and I first met about some uh, legislative measures that are happening in California that deal with uh, financing, uh, updating voter, um, voter moder voting modernization. And there was a bill, an Assembly Bill 668, Voting Modernization Bond Act of 2018, that addressed this. But I understand that that has changed a little bit. So maybe you can just fill us in on what the current status is of uh, voting modernization in California and what some of the options are in front of people. Sure. If, if we want to have elections that we can trust, we want to have machines we can trust, voting machines, voting software, right. and right. ones that are up to date. And California counties have some of the oldest voting equipment in the United States. So since 2000, when we had the fiasco in Florida, there was a federal Help America Vote Act that said that counties and states need to improve their equipment. We're still at a point where we haven't done that. So we're underfunded on the county level. We're looking at a state level of what to fund and how to fund it. And the question becomes, what are we incentivizing with these dollars? If we're gonna mm -hmm. move into the, the, the next era of voting equipment, and mm -hmm. a, a lot of the emphasis in the state legislature now is to fund counties who take advantage of a new law, which would eliminate precinct voting and have more regional voting centers throughout right. the county. And right. also to combine that with going to vote by mail. And instead of doing that, which arguably in some ways may make it easier uh, to vote, although I have other uh, arguments on how to make it easier to vote. Instead of that, we should really be focusing on how to have the most confidence that our vote is being right. counted. And right. our California constitution says that's the case. So mm -hmm. the way that we get there is by having many ways, but one way is having open source software. And what we mm -hmm. should be incentivizing with the money that we spend and give to the counties with matching funds is mm -hmm. to have open source software. Right. Now, open source is a broad term. Now, do you have a particular platform or system that you would have your eye on or does something like that still need to be built from scratch? Sure. So, so open source means that everybody can actually see the code, that mm -hmm. it isn't something that's privately owned and proprietary so that you say, well, we have to see how the votes were counted in the last election. And then it's a black box and we can't look inside and see how it's done. And that's right. happened in a lot of places. Uh, uh, Ohio in 2004 was famous for that. So open source is the concept that it's all available for everybody to see. Now you mm -hmm. said, are there different kinds? The best kind, we're familiar with copyrights for mm -hmm. private property. Mm -hmm. Well, with open source, what you want is copy left. And what copy oh. left means is not only does something, I know it's a great term, yeah, something it is. starts open source, 
but uh -huh. it has to remain open source. So let's say that your city adopts an open source system and then mm -hmm. 10 years later it wants to upgrade it and it sends uh -huh. out a bid to companies to work on that. They still have to do the work and then leave it open source. They can't then turn it into something proprietary. So right. San Francisco actually has an advisory task force looking at this issue right now and how to implement it there. Mm -hmm. Well, that it's always been a big debate, especially in our chat, and I know people will be mentioning it, the idea of do we go back to countable paper ballots or do we go to bank grade security open source, which I go to the RSA conference every year in San Francisco, the biggest you know, cybersecurity conference, and their method of checking in thousands of people in, almost instantly with top grade security is unparalleled. So I have no doubt that the technology is there. It just seems to me that those that are in charge of our voting systems right now aren't as keen to have voting be easier and more reliable. Is, is that a, a jaded perception or would you? Well, um, I, I do want to touch on that. But before we get to that, you mentioned paper ballots. And yes. we, we don't want to abandon paper ballots. California, mm -hmm. over 90% of the ballots cast, unlike a lot of states, are paper ballots. Mm -hmm. Then there's an image made of the ballot mm -hmm. and then those images are counted and there's a record of the count that happens after that right so the key thing is to be doing audits mm -hmm. that make sure that we're counting the paper ballots through this process now obviously there are recounts when an election's close and you do that all by mm -hmm. hand with paper ballots but mm -hmm. before that there are random audits that are done and the problem that we have right now in california and one of the differences between myself and the incumbent mm -hmm. is California just passed a bill called AB 840, mm -hmm. which actually cut back on our ability to audit the results. And this was shocking for a state like California. And what happened was instead of being able to audit both the votes that are cast and recorded as of election night, but then there's mm -hmm. also provisionals which come in until Thursday uh, or Friday, as well as uh, provisional votes, this new bill, incredibly, which was supported by our legislature, now set, and the um, Secretary of State says that the votes that come in on election night in the mail, uh, vote by mail or, or, or provisionals, aren't subject to audit. Imagine, this is, this is unbelievable. Yeah, it's true, in California. So imagine if the IRS said, we're only going to audit the money you report through September, but not the money from October through December. Now, mm -hmm. we mentioned voting centers before and the vote by mail process where if counties opt into this plan, a, a ballot will go to anybody at home. There's also a law that people can just bring in vote by mail ballots mm -hmm. en masse on election night. So now there's the potential, and I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but there's the potential now for people to bring in large numbers of ballots that won't be subbed on election night from people who have vote by mail ballots, and then they're not subject to audit. And the parties can do this, other the political parties can do this, other individuals can do this and bring the ballots in. So this was a really bad move. And if I was Secretary of State, I would push to overturn that law. I asked you a question the other day and you had a really good answer because we do have vote by mail in California. We, we get our ballots three weeks ahead of time and we have a lot of time to fill it out and submit it. And why, why not encourage people to do that, get, get their votes in you know, way early and assure that everything is counted? What's wrong with that? Right. We do a lot to try and make it easier to vote before Election Day, but mm -hmm. we don't make it easier to vote on Election Day. Mm -hmm. And in a democracy, we should benefit from the entire political campaign. Mm -hmm. And if we vote early, we lose the opportunity to have those debates and that information. So mm -hmm. our, um, our elections and what I propose is that we should have state holidays for the November general election and for the spring primary election. Mm -hmm. And the polls should stay open until 10 at night also for the people who have to work on state holidays. Make it easier first to vote on election day. Now, right. let's say that also, if you're a local candidate, you've been you've been canvassing for city council or school board, going door to door, and you get to you you know you're doing it the grassroots way, and you get to the door, and somebody said, "Sorry, I voted two weeks ago um, by vote by mail," and then that also favors people who have more money early because they can send out the mailers to the absentee voters, the vote by mail people who vote early before a grassroots candidate develops 
more funding. So I'm less interested in those ideas, although they're helpful, than I am making the election day better to start with. So that, that's my platform, Democracy Holidays. That makes a lot of sense. And I hadn't thought about, we, we saw that during uh, some recent elections, especially in Montana, where there were some shenanigans right up at the last minute. And a lot of people said, ooh, and I already voted for that guy. And I really right. wish I hadn't. So that's, that's right. That and we had that with, a lot of sense. with Arnold Schwarzenegger when he ran for governor. A mm -hmm. lot of women came out in the last couple of days. Most mm -hmm. people had voted as well. And there, there are many examples. You're right. Okay. Well, I think that those are the main topics that we had kind of gone over, but I know that there is uh, some something new on the horizon for you uh, that you wanted to share tonight for the first time, and we're honored that you chose our little show to do so. So yes. this is addressing conflict of interest by the Secretary of State. Can you um, explain yes. what this is and how it came about? Yeah, I'm going to be proposing a constitutional amendment here in California to deal with conflicts of interest. And the way to set it up is we think about Florida. When the Florida election was stolen in 2000, the Secretary of State, Catherine Harris, was the campaign manager for George Bush in the oh, election gosh. that she ran that George Bush competed. The same thing in 2004 in Ohio, Kenneth Blackwell, the Secretary of State, was the campaign manager for George Bush again. In both states, the elections were questioned in the Senate. I mean, there was debates about whether there was there were valid results. So now we moved to 2016 in California, and we had a contested Democratic primary, deeply contested. And there were many, many people who were Bernie Sanders supporters who felt there was not sufficient education done for people to understand that if you were a no party preference voter, in other words, not in a party, you had the opportunity to vote in the Democratic primary, but only if you asked for a Democratic Party ballot. And there were many reports around the state that that information wasn't communicated clearly. Mm -hmm. That communication is the responsibility of the Secretary of State, and our Secretary of State at that time had publicly endorsed Hillary Clinton and had campaigned for her in Nevada. So the perception of a conflict, I'm not saying this was the same thing that happened in Florida in 2000, far from it, but the perception of a conflict of interest is something that we do not want to have. So what I am proposing is that no secretary of state may endorse, support, or oppose any candidate or ballot measure in California when they are secretary of state. Number two, they can't make a financial contribution. And three, they can't be a member of those campaigns. It just seems to me this is a baseline, a yeah. baseline of a lack of conflict of interest. Because conflict of interest is not only financial, it's also political. So this is a constitutional amendment that you are that you are. Yes. So, and, 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 and where, what, what stage of that are you and how are you doing that? Well, I'm now that I've announced it on your program and, yeah. and thank you for the opportunity. I am going to be sending it to the uh, state assembly and state Senate elections committees mm -hmm. and ask some of their members to sponsor it mm -hmm. and get it on the ballot. And I would hope that our secretary of state would support it. Now, the irony was that I was going to come out publicly and pledge, and I will pledge right now, that I will not endorse in any race over which I would have any jurisdiction here. So frankly, I'm not gonna endorse in any race in California in 2018. And I was gonna ask that all other candidates in the race would take that same pledge, including our existing Secretary of State. He has already endorsed as of November in the governor's race. I couldn't believe it. Before I could even get out and ask for this pledge, mm -hmm. um, and, and I just don't think that's okay. And I don't think most voters support that either. No, I would think not. What can people do if they want to support you in this? I mean, it, so, they... so the, the state Senate elections committee, the uh, state assembly elections committee, you can go to the internet. Uh, you can just put it in your browser and look them up. They have a mm -hmm. staff member for each of them. Mm -hmm. You write to the staff member and say, I think that your committee should take up this issue. And on my campaign site, Mm -hmm. Feinstein for SOS.org slash issues. There's a link there to the specific text that I'm recommending. I'm going to be emailing it myself to those committees. So anybody who wants to go to my campaign site could find that link and then communicate to the state legislature. And let's get this dialogue going. Yeah, that link and all the other ones that we mentioned today are in the description of the video. So everybody, can, oh, you've, you've got it there already. So click there. Great. Great. So thank you. This is, but I, I feel I, I feel so educated. <laughs> well, and, and we should be more educated about how our elections are run. We should. 
And, you know, you speak about education. We own the California channel. It's our version of C-SPAN in the state. We mm -hmm. should be using that and giving free TV time for all candidates who qualify for the ballot and Absolutely. bring the information into people's homes instead of only the people who can pay to play. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. Does anybody have any, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't introduce Joseph at the beginning. Joseph Sakata, news editor, fabulous co-host. Um, do you have any questions uh, in chat? The head that have uh, There aren't any questions in the chat, but Bill, Gra Bill Gabriel did say, this is the most enthusiastic candidate for any secretary of state oh. anywhere that I've ever seen. <laughs> thank you so much. We bring that out in them. I mean, look, I was, I was a mayor in my city and I, and I just saw how important it was to listen to the average resident and hear what they had to say. It's a privilege to be in government and you have to honor that. And therefore, mm -hmm. I'm excited about having more democracy for California. Well, so are we. And that's why we are here. I just want to thank you again for coming on and sharing your expertise and just letting us know kind of what, what the state of this is, because a lot of us were very heartbroken at what happened during the primaries. I know for one, I dropped off my ballot, was driving up to the Bernie Sanders rally in San Francisco when I heard that the race had already been called. And I said, that, how could that be? They have not counted my vote yet. Right. So right. that 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 there is just shenanigans. And I, we really deserve uh, to have our votes counted, especially when we're working so hard to understand for whom to cast them. So... Thank you again. We hope that you'll come back um, later on in the in the race, or maybe we'll get you on We the People and have a little bit of a longer conversation. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much.